Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, to the book of Revelation and the second chapter. And we're going to read from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. We're going to be looking at the fourth of the seven churches, the church in Thyatira. Now we're going to call this the unrepentant church. And so it begins in verse 18. It says, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, saith the son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And I, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this city of Thyatira, uh, the name, uh, there's some dispute about the name. Some say it literally means castle of fire and others uh, and quite a considerable number would say that it has the idea of sacrifice, offering, uh, continual sacrifice or perpetual sacrifice. Certainly from church history perspective, this uh, church uh, looks at what we call the Dark Ages and the incredible rise of the papacy, and we'll, we'll be able to point out that as we go. It is the longest of the seven letters, written, ironically, to the most insignificant of the seven churches, as far as the city and its influence was concerned. It used to be influential, but by the time this letter is written, it's lost much of its influence. It also um, is the middle of the letters to the seven churches, and it really is very significant, and it's a real turning point. Uh, we'll point some of these things out as we go. It is a church which has taken what happened in Pergamos to a whole new level. If Pergamos was married to the world, then Thyatira had been living with the world for a long time, and it was entrenched in the world. Let's talk a little bit about the city itself. It was famous for its trade guilds. Uh, membership of the guilds was very advantageous as far as business was concerned. In fact, you could not operate your business without being a member. It was like a closed shop trade union type organization. Uh, kind of a precursor to the trade union movement. It was also uh, a social network, which included uh, idolatry, as each guild had a patron deity, and immoral drunken orgies were part of belonging uh, to the guild. And so you really had to be part of this if you wanted to prosper, uh, and there were guilds for different trades, if you really wanted to prosper in Thyatira. Uh, at these... Um, uh, these guilds, they would always attend the festivals of the various deities in the city. 
representing their guild there. They would eat meals in their temples. Uh, so it was really uh, just tied you in with the culture and all the evil connected with it. One of the most notable guilds in this city was that of the cloth dyeing guild or the dyers guild. Uh, Thyatira's real claim to fame was that they uh, was it was the center of the woolen industry, and also they developed a particular scarlet dye, which they uh, they would dye various garments. Now these garments were very uh, popular. Uh, we, we we're familiar with them if you remember Lydia. She was a woman of Thyatira from Acts sixteen, and she was a seller of purple. Uh, because that purple is kind of a scarlety color. Uh, and it, basically what they would do is they would dye woolen cloth and they would sell it to the Roman army. If you remember the Roman army, often they would they would have a scarlet um, cloak that they would wear. And so uh, part of their uniform included these scarlet cloaks. And so, so basically Thyatira had a wonderful government contract with the Roman Empire and they basically uh, uh, made these wool cloaks and dyed them with scarlet, and uh, it was very lucrative. And so the Dyer's Guild was one of the biggest of them all. Well, notice as well that uh, this city, um, it, it's kind of interesting that it's, it's, it's a woman, uh, women are associated with this city, three women. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the name Thyatira comes from the daughter of one of the Suclid generals, one of Alexander's four generals. And so it was named after a woman. So that's a very significant. Thyatira uh, was one of the general's daughters. And then, of course, we know of it because of Lydia, who was a wonderful example of a godly woman. But also there's another woman that we're going to learn about in this chapter and that is the woman Jezebel. So three women connected to this city, two of them that have a great focus of our attention, and that is Lydia and Jezebel. And we'll consider them as we go. So notice, first of all, as we think of this city and its guilds and all the things connected with it, the Lord appears to this city in this way. It says in verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, saith the son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. Now, it's again, just interesting that when we saw the vision in chapter one, uh, the Lord appeared to John, but not as the son of God but as the son of man. If you notice verse 13, it says uh, of chapter one, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the son of man, clothed with garments down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And of course, it talks about verse 15, his feet like unto fine brass. Uh, we saw in verse 14, his eyes are as a flame of fire. So there's, a, there's an interesting change that is made here. Son of Adam, uh, to the Son of God. So the emphasis here is more on his deity that is being brought before us than his humanity. Uh, the Lord Jesus as the one who is uh, indeed God the Son. And so, uh, of course, that's the fullest revelation, isn't it, of the Lord Jesus? If we, it, he, he is the fullest revelation of God. If we look back to Hebrews chapter 1, just a powerful verse, uh, but in Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by son, by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, and whom he also made the worlds. And so he is the fullest revelation of God uh, possible. He is, as it were, God manifest in flesh. He is the eternal son of God. And the concern of this letter is for holiness as opposed to compromise with the world, which is really what's going on in Thyatira. And so Christ's deity is stressed. And I think the thought is this. If you remember the one who Isaiah saw, who was holy, holy, holy in Isaiah chapter 6, 
well, that was the Lord Jesus. Uh, in fact, John tells us in John 12 that Isaiah spake of this when he saw his glory, speaking of Christ. And so the thought is that the one who is infinitely holy, the eternal son of God, that, that when people realize fully who he is, it will wake them up from their compromise and that they might, like Isaiah, say, woe is me. Uh, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So that's the thought. It's just revealing himself in his, his, his full undiminished deity. They were willing to join guilds devoted to some false deity. But what about their loyalty to the one who truly was the Lord from heaven? What about their loyalty to the one who was God manifest in flesh? What about their loyalty to the one who indeed is the son of God? And that's the question that is being put to them. He appears like this, his eyes like a flame of fire. And again, we see this idea of penetrating, nothing hidden from the blaze of that gaze. I love that little phrase, nothing hidden from the blaze of that gaze. His eyes like a, a flaming fire. Even down into Thyatira and the depths of Satan, nothing can escape his gaze. And then his feet like his fine brass. And the picture is judgment. He, he is about to move in judgment. And we're going to see this, that he is actually going to do something. He's going to exact discipline. And the discipline is going to send a message to all the churches. The Lord in his holiness is going to discipline this church and pay attention because it, it's directed to all the churches we'll see as we go it's interesting that there's a lot of emphasis on fire now i want to just say this that in all of the letters the the significance of the old testament illusion is greater in thyatira than anywhere else so i want you as we're looking at this letter to think about jezebel and to think about the original Jezebel in the Bible in First Kings. We want to think about her, and we want to think about who was against her. If you remember, it was really a contest between uh, Elijah and Jezebel. And who was Elijah? Well, he was a prophet who, what we think of him, we think of fire in connection with him. He is the one that called down fire to consume the sacrifice, right, on Mount Carmel. He's the one, actually, that in his depression, when he went in a cave, the Lord kindled the fire and put cakes on and, and, and fed him and ministered to him. And he was the one who, at his death, was taken to heaven in chariots of fire. So his ministry, uh, in a sense, it, it were reminded of fire. And so it's kind of fitting that when the Lord now, who is the one who is against this Jezebel, there's an emphasis on fire. His eyes are like a flaming fire. His feet are like fine brass as they had been in a furnace, burning, as it were, fiery. And so is the, the idea is God's judgment upon Jezebel and her system. But before we get to this judgment, we want to begin, as the Lord always does, by his commendation, the commendation from the glorified Christ. And again, we, we just want to learn from this. We want to learn practically from this, that when we have to correct error, we should always, as it were, bring correction on the back of praise. If we can find something that we can say good about a believer or about an assembly before we bring correction, we should always bring praise and, and commendation. And that's what the Lord does. And so he says about this church, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So he, he commends before he condemns. And he says, I know. He's aware of, now notice the emphasis on works. It mentions it twice here. I know thy works, and then at the very end of this, this kind of sentence where he talks about their charity, service, and faith, and patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. So clearly, there's a lot of service going on connected with this church. And there's a lot of love as well. 
Uh, notice this that, that he notice he talks about their charity so it's obviously a very loving and caring in many ways their love manifests itself in practical works and so we might say this if ephesus was truth at the expense of love remember they were really hot on truth but what they'd left their first love we could say the pendulum has swung to the other extreme. We've gone from truth at the expense of love to this church, which is love at the expense of truth. Isn't it difficult to find the balance? I know for myself, I struggle with this tremendously. Uh, getting the balance right, having speaking the truth in love, having love and truth together. Uh, very very challenging for us we tend to swing from one extreme to the other and so this particular church well there was a pleasant amiability about the church they wanted to get along with everything and everybody including the devil himself it seems because they're involved in the very depths of satan here and so perfectly kind uh, we would say a perfect church for our tolerant age this church would really fit in in our age of tolerance it really would no negatives at any cost all sweetness and light and sadly many are adopting this model today and it is successful people want to hear smooth words and and they want their ears tickled and they want to be encouraged. And we don't want any what we call negative ministry, nothing that will challenge us, words that will soothe us. Um, and so certainly uh, that kind of mentality is very prevalent in our age. It's very difficult, as we've already mentioned, to find the balance between sound doctrine and love and good works it really has been a challenge throughout the history of the church and we find that this church is challenged with this very thing and so it's certainly erring in the ditch of love and good works at the expense of standing for truth but the lord knew that their charity and their service and faith and their patience and their works uh, he knew all those things and so he does commend them but then he says this, verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So we're now introduced to really what is the salient feature of our study. And this is where we said the Old Testament background takes a prominent role. And we, we've observed the Old Testament background in the previous churches. We saw we began in Eden, uh, eating of the tree of life and evil present. We, we noticed that in Ephesus. And then we went on to uh, Smyrna and a picture of, of Israel in Egypt, uh, suffering but a limited time frame. Uh, yes, they were suffering, but only 10 days. Like in Egypt, they had 400 years. Uh, we had Satan uh, typified by Pharaoh. So we, we were in, in Israel and Egypt. And then we went in the last letter into the wilderness, wanderings. And we saw Balaam and we saw the sons of Korah and we saw all those kind of things uh, in Pergamos. But now we're in the land in the time of kings, especially in the northern kingdom, and in the dark days of Ahab and Jezebel. And many have suggested that the, the reign of, of Ahab was the dark ages of Israel's history. And certainly we can say without hesitation that Thyatira really does picture the dark ages in the history of the church. We're going to see the parallels with church history presently. So think about this lady Jezebel. Now, again, we said two women connected with Thyatira in scripture. Lydia, Acts 16, verse 14, a very good example of a faithful sister. We would say woman at her best. Uh, she may have even, some suggestion is that she may have even started the church 
in Thyatira. We, we, we know she's from there. We don't know how long she was in Philippi. And some have suggested that maybe she brought the gospel with her when she went back to her home city of Thyatira. We can't be dogmatic about that, but certainly she pictures a, a very supportive woman for the gospel. She wanted the apostles to stay with her, uh, to check out with the Holiday Inn and come and check in with her, and that she would, her house would become the base of the gospel spreading in the in the uh, in, in in Europe. And so, certainly, we we thank God for Lydia. And on the other hand, we have Jezebel, a wicked woman, woman at her worst. And it's interesting that she's the first of four women mentioned in the book of Revelation. And each of them, in a sense, represent a larger number. And so we have Jezebel, but clearly Jezebel, it's not just her, but she's got a whole party now. She's had profound influence. Uh, she's got her children. She's got even some of my servants have been seduced by her. So, so she's very influential. They, they, she's had a big influence in this assembly. And there are many that have gone with her. So there's Jezebel. Uh, that's the first woman that's mentioned. Revelation 12, we have the second woman mentioned. And of course, this is the woman. Uh, we won't look up the references, but she's the woman that gave birth to the man child uh, who would reign with a rod of iron and it's clearly a reference to the nation of israel we'll point that out when we get to revelation 12 but that's the second woman and then the third woman is in revelation chapter 17 the scarlet woman the whore uh, which is represents the false church in the last days that will basically bring the man of sin to power and to prominence and then the fourth woman again, representing more than just one person, is the bride in Revelation 19. Come and see the bride, the lamb's wife, and that represents the true church. And so interesting that this is the first of four women, but all representing a larger number than just one. What we could say here, without fear of contradiction, is that sisters can either make or break an assembly. Quite a statement, isn't it? You have Lydia, who I'm sure was a phenomenal influence in the assembly in Philippi, and also perhaps even here in Thyatira for good. And we thank God for every godly sister that has such a sweet influence in an assembly. But then we have a Jezebel who certainly was responsible for the Lord's judgment on this assembly. So again, I just want to say this. Women were the last at the cross and the first at the open tomb. The church owes a tremendous debt to her faithful women, which can cannot be fully estimated this side of eternity. I believe in glory. We'll see that perhaps many an assembly was kept going by the prayers of godly women, like the, the widow in 1 Timothy chapter 5, who prays night and day without ceasing. And so we thank God for the influence of godly wives and godly mothers and all the rest of it. And even in Israel, in their dark days of the judges, we've already witnessed the influence at the very beginning of the period of the, the book of Judges. Uh, there was a Deborah, and then towards the very end of Judges, there was a Hannah. So again, we just thank God for these and every one of them. And uh, we, for every wonderful sister who makes a huge difference. But here we have one who is not a good example. And the Lord is not afraid to name names and get down and personal. He says, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, <laughs> which calleth herself a prophetess. And it is interesting, isn't it? That the Lord is not afraid to name names, especially when there's truth connected with what's going on. And, and so he, he really does say that the problem in this assembly is a woman who has far too much influence for evil. Now, sadly, in one thing, in one sense, it says more about the men in the assembly than it does about Jezebel. Notice, thou 
sufferest that woman, Jezebel. I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel. When scripture clearly says, I suffer a woman not to teach nor usurp authority over the men. And yet they had allowed that woman, Jezebel, to have far too much influence. You see, there could be no Jezebel historically without a weakling called Ahab. If he was the man, she would not have had the prominence she did in Israel's history. And there could be no Jezebel in a teaching prophetic role in the church without weak men to allow it to happen. And that's the tragedy, really, is men not standing up and playing the man, <laughs> not taking their role seriously. That's really what happened in the garden. That's why God holds Adam responsible, even though Eve was the first in transgression. Adam didn't play the man. And that problem is still with us to this day. The men evidently were not willing to act as the authority over this woman who calls herself a prophetess. <laughs> it's interesting. She called herself, a, God's not saying she is. She called herself a prophetess. And the men were not willing to stand up and tell her to be quiet. When women have too much negative influence in the assembly, we're in trouble. Because not only does it say a lot about them, but it says more about the state of the men. Confusion of biblical roles is disastrous, and God is not the author of confusion. And here we have a confusion of biblical roles. Now, I want to do a brief biographical sketch of Jezebel. <laughs> and so we'll go back. Uh, you might keep a ribbon in our passage here. We're going to look at some verses quickly in First Kings. We want to learn about this woman because clearly uh, this is behind the thoughts of the Lord in this particular letter. And so look at 1 Kings 16. We want to just look at a little bit of her, uh, her history. Verse 29 of 1 Kings 16. 1 Kings 16, verse 29. It says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria, and Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So it all begins with a marriage. Ahab marries Jezebel. Just as we saw in Pergamos, which meant thoroughly married, when the world the church began to marry with the world, it, was a, it wasn't a good marriage when they embraced Constantine, and things get worse and worse. Now, we have the same thing. Ahab marries Jezebel and immediately begins to worship and serve Baal. We certainly need to counsel people to be very careful who they marry. Many a good man has been ruined by choosing the wrong wife. You might say, too, many a good woman has been ruined by marrying the wrong man. <laughs> we could say that equally an unequal yoke is not necessarily just somebody marrying an unbeliever but when a spiritually minded believer marries a carnal believer that also can be an unequal yoke you're still pulling in different directions one's looking to the world uh, for their satisfaction one is looking to the lord for their satisfaction and so again it all began with a wrong marriage look at chapter 18 now and verse 13, and notice what we see. It says, was it not told my Lord that I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men and the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. 
So we notice that Jezebel, not only did she promote Baal worship, but she killed the prophets of the Lord. She was a persecutor of the true saints of God. Jezebel did not like prophetic ministry. She didn't like the prophets of the Lord. She didn't like this, thus saith the Lord kind of message. And Elijah on Mount Carmel is not her kind of preacher. Too dogmatic, too fundamental. Uh, someone who tells it like it is. She must silence such men. N not have, she, she would say, perhaps to her husband, we don't want any of these kind of preachers back here again. We want people who are going to encourage the saints with smooth words and a few nice jokes thrown in uh, for good measure to make everybody feel good and happy. Men who will tickle ears and not make any demands on our lifestyle, who, <laughs> because we still want to offer at the altar of Baal, you see. And so she hated prophetic ministry. And again, I suggest that the woman here in Revelation 2 was of the same uh, ilk. Chapter 19 of of First uh, Kings 18. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So she supported 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah at her table, generous to a fault when supporting that which undermines the truth of God amongst the people of God, bringing in things that ought not have even been named among saints. Now look at chapter 21, just kind of a brief highlight of this woman and her um, career, her mad career, verse 25, but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. So she stirred her up her husband to sin. Like Delilah, she knows how to manipulate her husband to be a spokes, her spokesman and to get her way in the matters of the assembly. Look at 2 Kings 9 and verse 22, just for our final allusion to this woman before we go back to the text in revelation 2 it says in verse 22 of second kings 9 and it came to pass when joram saw jehu jehu that he said is it peace jehu and he answered what peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many whoredoms and witchcraft and uh, so, again, uh, committed whoredom and witchcraft. Witchcraft is connected, isn't it, in First Samuel 15, 23, uh, as rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So going back to Revelation 2, you might ask, how did she achieve all this in the local assembly? How was she able to somehow influence the church at Thyatira with her ways well, no doubt she would say things like this to the saints. What is wrong with joining with the local guilds? It's good for business. God expects us to use our common sense. How are we going to win the world if we do not join the guilds and get involved with them? And so using a lot of um, logic, human logic, she manages to persuade the Christians to compromise with the world that was incredibly evil in this particular day. And so the church's problem was a failure to face and deal with sin and judge it. Jezebel was allowed to get away with things, and no one was strong enough or man enough to grasp the nettle. There was no backbone. Weak men result in weak assemblies that face the censure of Christ. Perhaps the saddest aspect of this verse in verse 20 is this, that it says, you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach. And then notice this phrase and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed 
onto idols. Such was this woman's influence that those that calls the Lord calls my servants had been seduced by Jezebel's teachings. Now, isn't that, that's a kind of frightful thing, isn't it? But actual true, the Lord's servants, some of the Lord's servants had actually been seduced by this woman's uh, influence and teaching. So now we come to a call for repentance from the glorified Christ. And he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. So notice that, that God, in, even in his mercy, had given this woman opportunity, time to repent. But she refused. How gracious the Lord is that he would give this woman opportunity to repent. Sin and rebellion have a hardening effect. She got away with things for so long that patterns had become established. And it was very difficult to change. Adamant, the problem was with, not with her at all. She continued on. The church at Thyatira needed an Elijah-like challenge. <laughs> needed to be challenged. How long will you halt between two opinions? Choose today who you're going to serve. That was the message that was needed. But isn't it interesting? It makes you think. The law says, I gave a space to repent, but she repented not. And you just wonder, I just, I've just been mulling this over. And I can't be dogmatic about it, but I wonder, is there a point of no return? The Lord gives somebody a space to repent. And it is, it's very long suffering, very gracious. But there comes a point when he says, okay, you're, you've hardened yourself in that decision. All that's left is judgment. <clears throat> he gives a space to repent, but then he says, enough is enough. And he's going to deal with her. Notice what he says. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. Uh, the New King James says, I will cast her into a sick bed. <laughs> In other words, he's going to chasten her and she is going to be sick. So. We need to recognize sin is serious. And in her case, she gets sick and goes in a sick bed. And we, we see that, don't we, in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11. Many of you are weak and sickly, and some of you sleep. <laughs> Again, divine chastening was evident in the assembly at Corinth. I wonder if the man in James, when he calls for the elders of the church, was it a discipline issue? And the reason that he's calling the elders of the church is because uh, he's under discipline because of sin. His sickness, because it says, and if he's done anything wrong, <laughs> uh, let him tell the elders of the church. And I think that's the idea, that, that, that there's judgment involved in this. Notice, too, he says, again, this is very strong language. Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. So again, there are those that have gone wholeheartedly with her, embraced her teaching. And again, there's different factions in this assembly. I want you to notice that. Uh, there's the servants that have been seduced. There are those that have gone in with her wholeheartedly. And then we're going to see later on, there's a remnant that have not bought into her teaching. It's brought division in the assembly. But They'll, those that have fully associated with her in her teaching, he says, they're going to go into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And then notice verse 23, I will kill her children with death. Remember the ministry of Jehu in, uh, in the Old Testament, how he, with great zeal, killed all the descendants of Ahab and Jezebel. That was his mission. I will kill her children with death. And all, now notice this, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and, and hearts. And I will give to every one of you according to his works. Killing her children. Are we not reminded not only did her own children die, 
We remember the death of the 450 prophets of Baal that sat around their table like her children and the 400 men of Ashtoreth that Elijah slayed. Uh, also remember there was a terrible famine of three and a half years during this turbulent time. And of course, what about her own ending? Remember, she's thrown out of a window, having applied her mascara, uh, She's and she's eaten by dogs. Her children are pursued by Jehu with fanatical zeal and are all killed. Now, what we could say is this, that clearly the church at Thyatira experienced a very severe discipline of the Lord, including some dying, some being sick, and everybody in the other churches were being warned by his disciplinary action in this church. And so he says, it, the purpose of it is that all the churches might know. Uh, and again, that the Lord tries uh, the reins and tries the hearts, that uh, he, he is the one that has these eyes of a flame of fire. He, he is the son of God. And because he is the eternal son of God, we better not play games with him. Uh, we, we better be sober and serious because of who he is. So the, the example of the Lord makes of Jezebel and her children has all the churches in mind. And again, discipline, part of the purpose of it is to make people wake up to the reality of the holiness of God and, and, and his seriousness about dealing with sin amongst his people. Now notice verse 24 it says but unto you i say and unto the rest in thyatira as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of satan as they speak i will put upon you none other burden and so isn't it encouraging to know that even in this incredibly compromised church that was not repentant and had to be disciplined of the Lord, that there was within that church a remnant. Just as in the days when Elijah felt like he was the only one, and if you remember, the Lord showed him there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. <laughs> and so even here in this church of Thyatira, the Lord still had those that were loyal to him and had not giving in to the temptation. And maybe they were paying a huge price, not being part of these guilds. And uh, well, there was a price to be paid uh, uh, in terms of uh, your ability to, to do business. Uh, your ability to thrive in this community was greatly hindered. And yet there's blessing uh, in being faithful to the Lord. And so he says uh, concerning them, that I'm not going to give you any burden, but that which you have already. And of course, they've got enough burdens because they because they're they're affected by not succumbing to the temptation to join in with these guilds and all the rest of it. And so he says, um, I, I know the burden, but that you already have. Hold fast till I come. He has a promise for them. His coming is brought before them. We see it again in verse 28. I'll give him the morning star. What he's saying to them is, you got to look beyond the now. you got to think beyond the immediate. And remember, I'm the Lord and I'm coming. And remember, you don't want to be ashamed when I come. So hold fast. I am coming. And what a promise the coming of the Lord is for, for, for difficulties in our day. Even within this defiled assembly, there's a faithful remnant. It's a mixed multitude. No other burdens, but holding fast <clears throat> to the old paths until the Lord Jesus comes. Just like in the days of Elijah, there were those that held fast. Notice he says <clears throat> that they had not known the depths of Satan. Idolatry is really the depths of Satan. Through this, Baal had taken over Israel in their dark ages and would once again take over the church in her dark ages. You see, the devil is ever the enemy of the word of God. So in this case, Jezebel 
she silenced the true prophets of the Lord, called herself a prophetess, and she encouraged compromise and idolatry. And it is interesting, is it? Notice that the two things go together. Going back to the Old Testament example of Jezebel, she kills the prophets of the Lord. She doesn't want God's word, but then what does she do? There's a vacuum. If you don't have God's word and a message from God, well, what are religious people to do? Well, you can worship Baal and his and his idols. And so idolatry always is a replacement for the word of God. And so we see when we look at the church's dark ages, what, why were the dark ages called the dark ages? It wasn't because they hadn't invented electricity yet. It was the dark ages because the word of God was not accessible to the people. And instead, the people were encouraged to bow down and pray to idols. And that is exactly the history of medieval Christianity, if you like the dark. And even though within that, there's still a remnant. We'll think about that a little bit later. There was still a remnant even in those dark ages. But he says, for the overcomer, in verse 26, he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. See, it really is all about power. Jezebel wanted power in the assembly. Influence, power. Uh, Jezebel in the Old Testament, well, she wanted power too. And so uh, here are people that are loyal to Christ and maybe don't have the influence in the guilds and all the rest of it. But the Lord tells you, you be loyal to me and I'm going to one day give you power where it really matters. I will give you power over the nations. And it's interesting that when we look at the Dark Ages, which really looks at the papacy and its zenith of its power, the, the goal of Rome has always been world dominance. That's why they have embassies. Imagine a church with embassies all over the world. It, it wants world dominance. It really does. And the very thing that it wants, it's not going to have. But the true believers who are loyal to Christ, they, suffering with him in the day of his rejection, will reign with him in the day of his vindication. And so he says, I'll give them power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. It was they're going to reign with Christ. They're going to reign with him, the one who will rule with a rod of iron. They're going to reign with him for a thousand years. And um, that all rebellion will be put down in those days. Everything that's against him will be broken like a potter uh, breaking his vessels. And then it says, I'll give him the morning star. What a beautiful promise, the morning star. That's the promise of the rapture. You see, the morning star comes before the sun comes up with healing in its wings. The last thing you see before the sun comes up in its zenith is the morning star. So the Lord comes to the church as the morning star, and then he's going to come to Israel as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. And the idea is this, that to the overcomer, Christ is both the rewarder and the reward at the same time. Think about that. He's both the reward and the rewarder. He's going to come for his people. They're going to see the one who they have been loyal to. They're going to see him face to face. They're going to enjoy him forever. So sometimes business interests which may be successful in the short term, have to be sacrificed for a clear conscience and the joy of serving the Lord without compromise. The Lord says this, no man can serve two masters. <clears throat> He's going to either love one or hate the other. It's time to make a choice serving Christ and not the guilds and all its compromise. And uh, amazing, there's so many Christians involved in things like that. I In the South, where we lived for a while, it was very common for Christians to be very involved in um, Freemasonry. Now, that just blows my mind. I, I can't understand how anybody would be involved in anything like that, but they are. 
And I've been to Christian funerals, even people from assemblies, and they've had a Freemasonry ceremony at the funeral. It just shocking. But that's exactly, to me, that's the doctrine of Jezebel. That's Jezebel through and through. It's this idea of compromise. Now, I'm going to quickly just mention about the church history element here. We've already hinted at it. AD 500 to 1500 was a period in church history called the Dark Ages. Jezebel introduced idolatry, the Dark Ages, the continual sacrifice. It's when the idea of the mass comes into vogue. Now, it didn't actually become official, I think, till 1215, transubstantiation, but it was already being practiced before it became an official dogma of the church, this idea of continual sacrifice. But isn't it good that even in the Dark Ages, God did not leave himself without a witness? And there were groups. Now, the, 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 the Church of Rome uh, maligned them because the winner gets to write the history books. And so groups like the Albigenses, the Waldensians, the Lollards, Bernard of Clairvaux would be one you know, that we think of. Many of these individuals were God's remnant in this period even though their character had been blackened by the Church of Rome, just as Jezebel blackened the character of Naboth, who was really a man who was loyal to his inheritance, refused to give up his inheritance at any price. And so the parallels with Romanism are obvious, based on a marriage between the world and the church, system built around a woman, uh, of course, Mary, uh, the mother of, of God, so-called by Catholicism, the mother church, claims to be a prophetess. The church claims that when it speaks, it speaks ex cathedra, without error, and, uh, and, and with authority, the same authority of scripture as the church speaks. Uh, again, we see that fornication, uh, uh, incredible immorality that has gone on under the guise of that system. Uh, responsible for the martyrdoms of multitudes of men and women, just like uh, she killed the prophets of Baal and repented not. Here's the interesting thing, that all the Protestant reformers were Catholic priests and not one of them ever wanted to leave Rome. They wanted Rome to repent. Hus, Luther, Menno Simons, John Calvin, all were Catholic educated individuals who wanted to reform the church. That's why it's called the Reformation, rather than to leave the church. But the church refused to repent. It repented not of its fornication. And it will go into great tribulation. I have no question whatsoever that after the rapture of the church, in the Catholic church, it will be business as usual. And they will go into great tribulation. And they've always wanted temporal power that's been their desire. But the good news is that they will actually be destroyed by the beast system that they actually try to bring to prominence. And the true believer is the one who will reign with Christ. <laughs> and so just the divine irony of it all. So may the Lord encourage us as we consider these things. We're living in days where the pressure to compromise is huge. And the Jezebel language is, 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 it seems to make sense. You know, you want to get on, you want to, you want to reach the world. You got to become like the world. You got to be like them. You got to adopt their ways. And, you know, we've got to be more inclusive. Uh, we, we've got to, uh, you know, we, we've got to be more accepting. And, uh, and some evangelicals now, are even now beginning to accept things that God clearly condemns because they want to be accepted. And what is it? It's, it's Jezebel and her false teachings that are still influencing the church to this hour. May it not influence us. And what's required is for men to be men. The message of this, if there's one message here, is this. Quit ye like men, be strong. <laughs> Play the man. Stand up. Stand up for the word of God and do not compromise however attractive it may seem. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.